The Honorable Chief Justice and Associate Justices of the Supreme Court. The House will come to order. The Senate will come to order. AB 868. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and members. I'd like to first accept the amendments that have been suggested by the committee and thank the committee staff for working with me and, uh, on this measure. AB 868 will require existing judicial training programs for judges, attorneys, and court-appointed special advocates include um, the effects of sexual orientation and gender identity expression on juvenile and family law proceedings, as well as cultural competency and sensitivity relating to and best practices for providing adequate care to LGBT youth and in the child welfare system. LGBT youth are disproportionately target for discrimination and harassment in the child welfare system by their youth peers, uh, facility staff, and other service providers, including foster parents. As families are becoming increasingly diverse, gender identity and sexual orientation are becoming more important areas of diversity. There are groups of people who do not have knowledge of issues that are impractical or impactful to the LGBT community. AB 1856, a bill I authored last year that became law, included LGBT cultural competency and sensitivity curriculum in the training for foster youth caregivers and service providers. By including this curriculum into the current judicial training program, the bill will simply continue the significant progress toward the goal of developing competence to serve children whose actual or perceived sexual or orientation is other than heterosexual and children whose gender identity or expression is incongruent with their biological sex or with cultural expectations. I respectfully ask your I vote. And with me uh, today to testify, I have Sherry Wise from CASA and uh, Candy Mayles from uh, the Dependency Legal Group of San Diego. Okay. Ms. Wise? Yeah, hi, I'm Sherry Wise, and I'm a CASA for a young person who is transgendered. Um, my training consisted of about 30 minutes of telling me, yeah, there are gay and transgender kids out there. You might get one. And that was pretty much all I got. When I accepted my youth um, and got to know him, I realized that it's a very complicated issue. And it's taken me almost two years to sort of, on my own, dig my way out of how to help him, how to support him, what, my, what his rights are. Um, and, and that kind of thing. And I think it's really important for these kids who are uh, so overrepresented in the foster care system to get this assistance and get people in those positions of authority over their lives trained so they understand them better. And I hope you can all support this bill. Thank you. Next witness. Thank you, Madam Chairperson and members of the council. My name is Candy Mays. I'm the executive director of the Dependency Legal Group in San Diego. We provide all of the legal services to all foster youth in San Diego County. We have 67 attorneys on staff. I'm here in support of this bill because it's training that's needed both for our attorneys as well as all uh, judicial officers and employees of the court. And the reason that it's needed is because the law requires minors counsel to provide investigation, independent investigation and information to the court and to advocate for the needs of the youth. They need to know what they're looking for. They need to know what questions to ask. And very often, attorneys don't know what they don't know yet. And the same thing with judicial officers. They need to know what questions to ask. They need to know if the reports they're receiving from social services, from minors counsel, are lacking in any area. And they're only going to know that if they have the training in order to be culturally sensitive to these issues. In addition to being a lawyer, I'm also a businesswoman. And I run this firm, and I realize that in this economic environment, discretionary funds are being spent very judiciously, if at all. And so what this bill does is it allows a mandate to say the legislature has set a priority for this type of training. And we all have training programs in place, both for the attorneys, the bench has training programs in place, the programs itself exist. This is about the curriculum and what needs to be included. 
And it's important for, I think, this council and for the legislature to say, these are the priorities that we're setting. It sends a message to the bench and the bar. It also sends a message to the community and to these youth to say, this is important, this matters, and we're going to raise this up on our level of priority. Training for this very important issue is not discretionary. It's not voluntary. It's not when you get around to it. It's important, and it has to happen. One thing we do know about training for lawyers in particular is that self-selection for voluntary training fails, because the people who self-select to go to training are typically not the ones who actually need it. So trainers end up preaching to the choir. And not that I'm not an advocate for repetition and for learning new things and new trends that come out in the research, because I think that's important. But we're often not reaching the very individuals that we need to reach who are making really important decisions. So I ask the council to please support this bill uh, in order to support these youth. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any other witnesses in support of the bill? Come on up. Looks like we need a couple more microphones here. And keep your testimony very brief, please. We've heard from two witnesses already. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Roger Chan, and I'm the executive director of East Bay Children's Law Offices. Uh, my office is a children's law firm in Alameda County, and we are appointed to represent all of Alameda County's uh, children and youth in juvenile dependency court. I also support this bill, and I won't repeat my colleague Ms. May's comments, um, but I did want to add a couple of um, points. Uh, the first is that I do believe AB 868 will do two very important things. One is it will reduce the likelihood of re-traumatizing LGBT youth in court. And the second is that it will provide a safe environment for youth to come to court and talk to the judge. The Juvenile Dependency Court is a very special place in which it's not adversarial, but it's an opportunity where the judge is charged with um, monitoring the best interests of all children before him or her. And it's a place where the advocates, the CASAs and the children's attorneys, are charged with bringing to the court's attention any uh, particular needs that the child may have. And as I mentioned, it's also the place where the young person can come talk to the judge directly. Um, in Alameda County, just a few examples of some of the issues that have come up in, uh, recently have been a situation where we had a young man who was being physically abused because his father thought he was too effeminate. We, had a, we have a 12-year-old boy who's dressing up in his foster mom's uh, high heels and makeup. Uh, we had a teenage girl who asked the judge for permission to start her um, hormone replacement treatment. And we have, um, we have a young man who has chronic truancy because he's been bu bullied in school due to his sexual orientation. These are the type of uh, everyday issues that come up in our cases that are important for the judges to have the competence and sensitivity to address. <clears throat> Adolescence is hard for all youth. It's harder for uh, LGBT youth who are figuring out their identity, and it's especially hard while they're doing that in foster care, especially when they don't have the support of their families. Uh, as Ms. May said, uh, we all, as advocates and as the court responsible for their well-being, need to know what questions to ask. We need to know where the services are. And just finally, I wanted to, uh, this is a natural extension of AB 1856, requiring the same such training for caregivers and this is uh, an opportunity to enhance the accountability that the juvenile court and the advocates can provide uh, to make sure that uh, this popula population of vulnerable youth are having their needs met. So I also urge support. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next witness. Joe Michael for Equality California, also in support of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Other witnesses? Julian Aguilar from the Foster and Kinship Care Education Program. I am also in support of this bill. Thank you. Madam Chair, Senators, good afternoon. Alan Hertzfeld on behalf of the Judicial Council. Uh, the Council has no position on AB 868, but has concerns over the precedent that this type of legislation may create. Judicial education is managed by the Center for Judicial Education and Research, which was formed in 1973 by the Judicial Council and the California Judges Association, and through the active involvement of members of both organizations, is able to effectively focus the limited training resources available to the Council to the areas where they are most needed. The Council has no position on AB 868 because the training contemplated by the bill is already part of the seizure training program for juvenile court judges. The Council is concerned, however, that future, that future legislative mandates related to judicial education may create, may restrict, excuse me, may restrict the Council's ability to educate California jurists in the most effective and efficient manner possible.
The principle of separation of powers dictates that the judiciary be a co-equal and independent branch of government, independent of mandates from both the executive and legislative branches. Finally, I would like to, on behalf of the council, I'd like to thank committee staff and the author for accepting the amendment. Uh, the council is concerned that the goals are in are to target training for juvenile court judges and government code section 68553 is actually targeted towards family court judges while welfare and institutions code section 304.7 is for juvenile court judges so we thank the author and the staff for that change but still recommend deletion from the bill regarding government code section 68553 thank you thank you uh, any other witnesses in support or in that gray area of no position? <laughs> any witnesses in opposition? All right, we'll bring it back to the committee. Senator Jackson. Yes, I'd like to ask the gentleman who just came up here on behalf of the courts, um, and uh, I think most of us here, or hopefully most of us here, are sensitive to the need to have a, an acknowledgement of the co-equal nature of the judiciary. and and um, its independence. But I'm wondering, uh, you know, for many years we've had real problems with things like gender equity in the courts and uh, issues pertaining to moving uh, our society along in more um, uh, just and equal ways, whether it's race, race or gender or uh, sexual orientation, what have you. And uh, yes, in, in, in order to achieve levels of equality in our society. And if I'm not mistaken, there have been periods of time where we have um, uh, encouraged, asked, uh, cajoled, required the courts to recognize those public policies of creating equality uh, and have uh, then thus required that the courts uh, do more in that regard. Uh, uh, am I correct on that? Have there been, uh, is there precedence for uh, the legislative branch to assert public policy and, and ask and require the courts to, to comply with such things as creating uh, greater um, uh, equality either within the judicial branch or for litigants? I mean, this is not uh, precedent setting, is it, this request? Well, in terms of the training requirements, I believe that it would be when it hasn't been a mandate specifically requested by the council. The, in terms of diversity in the branch itself, that goes to appointment of judges and justices. Um, the legislature and executive's role is to pass the laws to create the code and it's the judiciary's role as an independent branch to interpret it. This goes beyond that standards, that policy and creates a mandate directing the judiciary in a certain manner. And so I we're, we're getting to the point now where um, you're, you're getting really close to taking a position against the bill and I don't think that's really where you want to go. Uh, and the issue of the separation of powers and the balance of powers is an interesting one, but it's a little bit beyond, I think, the scope of this bill again. Thank you. Well, Madam again, Chair. but that was the, uh, I was interested in pursuing this a little bit because I heard that as one of the right. explanations for, if you will, the gray area, and I'm just wondering whether, whether you perceive this as being precedent setting or whether this is uh, well, not. Well, it's clearly not precedent setting. <laughs> it, it, if I may. If I may just briefly. Well, I'm going to let you take a very brief opportunity to answer the senator's question, but we really don't need to get into a whole theoretical debate about the separation of powers. And I might add the balance of powers, because they're two different things. <clears throat> as, as I stated at the beginning, the council has no position on this because this is training. What's in this bill is actually training that is already in place, but it's just a concern the council would like to express to the legislature going forward. I think that's fair. Senator Leno and then Senator Corbett. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I want to recognize Assemblyman Amiano's consistent advocacy on behalf of cultural competency and sensitivity to the needs of LGBT youth in our juvenile justice system. And it's not just a feel-good exercise. This subset of youth are significantly overly represented in our juvenile justice system. They have specific needs because of the way they're often treated by their natural families, and we recognize that upwards of 40% of all of our homeless youth on our streets recognize, identify as LGBT. So this is a population in great need. I would like to see the bill 
include sensitivity training for the Boy Scouts, but I understand that they are a private organization. <laughs> That's a different branch. And we, we probably can't do that. <laughs> different branch Beyond of government. Beyond the scope of this. I'll bill. help them across the street, though. <laughs> and I move the bill. And I'd like to be added as a co-author if you're amending the bill along the way. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Corbett? I, I just wanted to quickly add, um, it doesn't take too much convincing by the witnesses that spoke in support that this is very much needed. And uh, Senator Leno beat me to it, but I wanted to make a motion as a member of the co-equal branch of government who legislates. So I'll let you do make that motion, but I'm glad to support this measure. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I do just want to note that uh, we have a system of checks and balances. So we, while all three... Uh, uh, three, uh, the legislature, the administration, and the judiciary would like to believe we're completely independent of one another. We are certainly not. Um, all right, we have a motion. Uh, any other questions or comments? Mr. Amiano, would you like to close? Yes, thank you very much. You know, the reason we included both family and juvenile court is that oftentimes families whose children end up in foster care start in the family court during custody uh, disputes. And so that the motivation for the education comes from that. But this uh, issue of cultural competency, particularly for LGBT, is on a continuum. And as I mentioned last year, uh, we did the uh, social workers, and uh, this year we wanted to move forward with the uh, uh, judicial system as well. So I respectfully ask for an I vote. May I, may I just ask uh, yes, one? Senator Jackson. You know, I, I, as I'm thinking about this, um, uh, is have you done something in the dependency courts? Have you given some thought about also adding training there? Because that is a place where we see a lot of these youngsters, and uh, if the goal is to try to create that sensitivity, I don't think we should exclude them just a thought, and I also want to uh, express my appreciation for your um, uh, graciousness this morning and say that I appreciate the wonderful author that we have here before us this afternoon as well. <laughs> Thank well, you very much. Senator Jackson, it, the amendments that the author took in this committee actually address the concern you just raised. Good. Okay, we have a motion, and we'll call the roll. The motion is due pass as amended to the Senate Appropriations Committee. Evans? Aye. Evans, aye. Walters? Walters, no. Anderson? No. Anderson, no. Corbett? Aye. Corbett, aye. Jackson? Jackson, aye. Leno? Leno, aye. Monning? Aye. Monning, aye. All right, the uh, vote is five to two, and that is the first vote out of committee today. Oh, thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, Mr. Appreciate it.